Will you pray with me, please? Lord, help us to hear your voice among all the others we hear today. Help us to know that you are the one to follow. Help me to lead us into your fold and none other. In the name of your Father, we pray. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is part of the gospel we read this morning. I'm not normally one who can quote chapter and verse out of the Bible, but here I can, probably because the numbers are so easy to remember, but also because of what it says. The chapter verse is John 10.10. Couldn't get much easier. As long as I can remember my own name and the number 10, I can remember this. One day I might forget my name and how to count, but I hope I will always remember what Jesus says in John 10.10. And that is, the thief comes only to kill and destroy but I have come that you might have life and have it in abundance. And to tell the truth, it's only the second half of that that I like the best. The part about I have come that you ha might have life and have it in abundance. I've thought about this my whole life, about what abundance means and how this one statement from Jesus could alter my life. Before I get to that, however, I feel that I need to address everything else that we read this morning, the rest of everything that came before, before verse 10, including that 10a, the first half about thieves and robbers killing and destroying. I can't totally ignore these things because they're all things Jesus said. And since I go around all the time professing that I'm above, above all else, I just want to be a follower of Jesus, mirror what he did and say in the world. And if that's the case, I better pay, pay attention to everything he said and did. There is only one problem with my simple yet noble goal of following Jesus. And that is that Jesus said quite a few things that simply don't make sense. Now that's, not, that's something I would not have admitted readily until recently. That is, I sometimes can't understand what Jesus is talking about. But then I realized because it says so, that Jesus did this on purpose. He tried to confuse us. He tried to go around confusing people he spoke to. He purposely spoke in parables and used figures of speech that confounded people. At one point, the disciples even asked him, why do you keep speaking in parables? Or in other words, Jesus, what's up with the way you keep talking to us? Don't you know that no one can understand you? Can't you simply tell us what you mean without being so evasive all the time? That's what I would say. Not only do you speak in parables, but by the way, what's a parable? <laughs> and then today it says that he uses figures of speech. We all know what a figure of speech is, right? That's what I used to think. Sure. But then I have to admit, I really don't know, didn't know what a figure of speech was until this morning when I decided to go look it up. I've heard the phrase, said the phrase, used the phrase, but an actual definition of a figure of speech, could you give me one right now? Well, a figure of speech is a word or phrase that is used in a non-literal sense for rhetorical or vivid effect. Well, continuing in the theme of that I don't really know what things mean, 
I had to then go up, go and look up the word rhetorical. <laughs> I think I know what it means, but I looked it up and you know what it said? I hate this when dictionaries do this. Related to or concerned with the art of rhetoric. Because <laughs> then you have to go look up rhetoric. Rhetoric means language designed to have a persuasive or impressive effect on its audience, but often regarded as lacking in sincerity or meaningful content. So then I said to myself this morning, that's what Jesus talked about all the time? In figures of speech, they're only meant to impress us, not really true, no meaningful content. Perhaps he wasn't even sincere when he said it. How's that supposed to help me? That's what I'm supposed to follow and do in my life, walk around saying things that don't mean anything and confuse people? Now, I know that this is the point some of you will answer, John, that's exactly what you do. We never know what you really mean. <laughs> Which I take as a compliment, because after all, I am trying to be like Jesus. But that's not why we're here. I assume we're here because there is some sort of expectation whether it's completely misplaced or not, that somehow I'm going to tell you what all of this means. So here it goes. Before Jesus got straight to the point this morning and tell, told us that he wants us to have an abundant life, he first uses a figure of speech about sheep and sheep gates and shepherds and thieves and bandits and different voices and all, all sorts of things. And at one point, he says that he's the shepherd. But then he says he's the gate that lets the shepherd in. So if he's not the shepherd, I guess the thieves and bandits are the shepherd, right? But then he says sheep won't listen to thieves and bandits, they'll only listen to the real shepherd. But again, if that's not him, then who is it? Which, of course, we know is really him, because he says it two sentences later, basically in the same breath, I am the good shepherd. And then, since he's talking to a bunch of Pharisees right now, we are normally supposed to think that they are the thieves and bandits which I actually still think, but now I'm not sure. So being a thoughtful and truthful preacher, I backed up in the gospel to see in what context all of this is taking place, something I ask us to do all the time. Back up at least a paragraph or two, if not a whole chapter, see what else is going on. And what's going on is this all takes place in the same context right after Jesus heals the blind man on the Sabbath. Remember, and all the uptight religious leaders start to question the blind man on this, you know, did Jesus really do this on the Sabbath? He was working on the Sabbath. They're trying to get him, you know, to basically incriminate Jesus so they can finally get him. Except the blind man who can now see just frustrates the religious know-it-alls because he never really answers their questions, but just keeps witnessing to the power of Jesus that healed his blindness. Then, if you remember the story, the Pharisees go and haul the man's parents in, start questioning them, but they don't fall for it either and further frustrate the Pharisees. See what good company I'm actually in? Finally, Jesus goes back into the temple where all this is taking place, basically to tell the Pharisees, cut it out, stop bothering these people, and then ends up giving a speech about spiritual blindness, telling everyone, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who can see will be blind. 
To which the Pharisees, again, have no idea what that means, and ask Jesus, what, you calling us the blind ones now? To which Jesus answers, very truly I tell you, if anyone enters the sheep gate by, the, by someone else besides me, they are nothing but a thief and a robber. And then the whole thing we read this morning about I am the gate, I'm the one who lets the shepherd in, you're nothing but a bunch of thieves and robbers, the sheep will never follow you, because you know what, I'm actually the shepherd too the good shepherd, and all my sheep follow me. Kind of end of that story. And the only problem with that part, that the sheep will only follow him and not anybody else, if you've ever met a sheep, <laughs> you will know they'll pretty much follow anyone. They used to follow me all the time when I'd walk through them, and I didn't even want them to. In fact, you don't even have to convince all the sheep to follow you. Just the head sheep, the alpha sheep, so to speak, the other, the sheep that others look up to. If you can get that one to follow you, they all do it. Which leads us back to, what are you talking about, Jesus? Is it blind men now seeing, seeing men going blind, sheep, robbers, thieves, shepherds with nice voices that the sheep will follow? All of which Jesus answers with my favorite answer to too many questions you ask all at once. Yes. I mean all of those things. Because, and here it is, thieves and robbers come only to kill and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance. That's all you need to know. John 10.10. 10 and really only John 10, 10b. Because then I say, when I finally get to the end of that whole story, I got it, Jesus. Please, no more talking. And in this story, Jesus does stop talking for a little while. And I can rest assured that I do understand what Jesus is saying. And that I can come in here and tell you all about it. So you got it? Good. Because now is the time we actually go back to the beginning of the sermon and answer the question that started off this whole thing, and that is, what is abundant life? You remember we asked that question before all this confusing stuff in the middle? What is it? First off, I hope we all know it is not a fat bank account. If you still think Jesus came to give you money, you're in the wrong church. For this, I do know. Abundant life is not about quantity. It is about quality. What is the quality of our lives? What is the meaning of our lives? Do our lives have meaning? Are we contributing to the betterment of the quality of life of others? The assumption that everything is always about us is not the primary meaning in the definition of abundance as Jesus defines it. As Jesus uses it. As Jesus stops using figures of speech and tells us directly why he came from heaven to earth to save us. And he came to give us life and to give it to us in full. And life abundant is a life that lets us touch the deepest part of ourselves that connects us with the divine, with the holy, with that cosmic force of love that keeps everything together in the, in the universe, with what's good and true and beautiful in the world. For it is this type of abundance that is rooted in what Jesus said and did. It's a love. It's all about love. 
love that leads to more love. It's joy. Joy that leads to more joy. It's peace. Peace that leads to more peace. Abundant life is kindness that leads to more kindness. It's compassion that leads to more compassion. It's a quality of life that allows us to go deeper and more fully into our own lives so that we may go more deeply and fully into the lives of others. And abundant life never, ever adds pain or suffering to the lives of others. Abundant life is the life that Jesus came to give us. His life, his way of being in the world, the way that leads us more fully into the presence of God so that we might be a reflection of the goodness of God. And how do we do that? Well, if we still need a rule book to tell us exactly how to do things, that's fine. Go back to the first passage we read today from the Acts of the Apostles, where it plainly says, without rhetoric, without impressive words, just the sincerity of devoting ourselves to teaching and fellowship. The breaking of bread and praying together, tending to the needs of others, even if it means we have to sell everything we have to do so. So think about that whenever you read my favorite verse, John 10.10, 10. that abundance comes from giving it all away just as Jesus did for us. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, help us to hold on to you by holding on to nothing else in this world. When we reach out our hand to hold you, may we reach out the other to hold someone else's hand at the same time when we ask that we be filled with your love and grace and mercy, let us do so in abundance, so much so that we have to share it with others. And God, therefore, we pray this morning, not just for ourselves, but for those who suffer in this world, who suffer in mind and body and soul, whatever it may be, there are so many people in so many places that need a kind touch, a word of compassion, a sense of peace, a sense of peace in their lives or perhaps just in their souls, which is what you can give us. We ask all of this in the name of your Son. Amen. Amen. Now, my friends, let's take a moment of silence and think about these things. Amen. Amen.